The FIFA World Cup is the most watched sporting event on the planet, with more than 3.5 billion viewers set to tune in for this year's 2022 Qatar World Cup. But how the hell do they film it? Well, that's exactly what I'm gonna break down for you in this video. Let's start with cameras. There's a bunch of angles that you'll see throughout the duration of a 90 minute World Cup match. From the predominant side angle that makes up most of the match's coverage, to cable cams, jibs, ultra slow motion cameras, a heli cam, and more recently, some VAR specific cameras. You may have thought that it takes hundreds of cameras to capture an event like this, but actually only 42 cameras actually make their way into the stadiums. Which don't get me wrong, is still a lot, but not really when you consider that an awards show like the Oscars reportedly has around 55 cameras to capture everything that just goes on within a single auditorium. Here's the match coverage plans for the 2022 Qatar World Cup. We've got two aerial cameras, including a helicam and a drone. The helicam is essentially a camera system that sits within a stabilized head on the outside of a helicopter. It's used to capture establishing shots of the stadiums before the match, alongside this pretty cheap drone in comparison, which captures more of the stadium's atmosphere during halftime and after the game's finished. There's a beauty camera right in the corner of each stadium to show off maybe the most expansive wide angle of the stadium in all of its glory, and a cable cam that follows the action close to the pitch from a bird's eye perspective. This stabilized camera system runs off some pretty insane technology where it's essentially connected via four cables that all retract and allow this camera system to move up and down and essentially move 360 all around the pitch. You'll often see this angle zooming across to track a player making his way from the halfway point all the way to the opposition's goal to score an epic finisher. Moving into slow motion cameras, there's eight in the stadium that are super slow motion and an additional four that are ultra slow motion, which are these crazy high frame rate detailed images of the players. I've seen these used a lot in the Qatar World Cup coverage whenever a player misses an absolute sitter of a shot and you can just see the sheer anguish on his face. Or while going ballistic after smashing the ball into the back of the net to secure their side a last minute victory. Fun fact, two of these ultra slow motion cameras are literally just behind the goals, offering a super immersive look into all the action that's happening right in the penalty area. Two different Steadicam operators roam pitch side, which you'll often see behind players as they take throw-ins or corners. There's also two roaming gimbal operators up in the stands with all of the fans, but these often aren't the same shots of fans that we see engrossed in the game before they realize that their humongous face is plastered on the screens within the stadium. These cameras are perhaps the most versatile of the bunch, hence why there's 15 of these 4K Ultra HD Sony HDC 5500 slash HDC 3500 scattered around the stadium. They're paired with these crazy long Fujifilm zoom lenses that you only realize just how gigantic they are when you notice how small the camera looks in comparison. These things are unbelievably expensive, costing around a quarter of a million dollars, depending on the focal length coverage. And you can see why by just how fast and zoomed in these lenses can get. To my knowledge, there's barely any lenses that can zoom in this fast and have this wide of a focal range. The one I've commonly seen used in World Cup matches is the eight to a thousand millimeter, which gives each camera camera operator the ability to get a super wide perspective and also an incredibly tight zoomed in angle all the way from across the stadium. All the cameras I've mentioned previously are shot in a mixture of HDR and SDR, but eventually they go for a color space transform pipeline so that if you're watching on a TV that's either in HDR or SDR, it doesn't really matter because it will all appear matched up together. There's also several other cameras that don't appear in this match plan. These include roaming ones that capture the fans, team arrivals, etc. I guess they're not included in this main plan because these camera operators don't really have a fixed position that they need to stick by. All 42 of these camera angles combine to produce over 150 hours of content per 64 games that happen throughout the entire competition. Keep in mind that the VAR team who make up the video assistant referee system also have access to these 42 broadcast cameras to review any potential fouls or offside decisions, most of which do get played back for the viewers to see at home. However, there's additional cameras specifically for the system which aren't seen within the live broadcast of a match. But we do get to see these PlayStation 1 kind of graphics looking 3D representations of fouls and offsides. It's these 12 motion cameras on the underside of the stadium's roofs, all powered by AI that help make this happen. Logistics. Let's take a look at the logistics for how a World Cup match actually ends up on your TV screen. So we've got all the cameras in place, but now how do we choose which ones get seen by the people at home? Well, that's where these six production directors come in. Each one manages their own hand-selected production teams, including gallery operators in the production control room. But because this enormous amount of footage would just be way too difficult for one person to keep track of, even with multiple monitors, they split it up into production teams that focus on specific content. Things like shots of fans in the stands and all of the slow motion shots from the high speed cameras. These teams are responsible for picking out the best moments as a match is happening and then queuing these up for the production director so that he can view them and then decide to add them into the main broadcast feed.
speed that's shown at home. For instance, a slow-mo reaction shot of Ronaldo doing a soo after he finishes scoring a goal. The production director calls out each angle change to his team as the broadcast is happening live. Three, take three. Four, take four. Ready, two, take two. Ready, nine, take nine. Ready, three, three, take three. So it's really the job of the production directors to help facilitate the most compelling story for each game and to best showcase the moments that draw fans into the emotions that happen within each match. The main feed in the MCR, which stands for Master Control Room, is then sent to the 300 broadcasters that distribute the matches across 210 countries all over the world. And they'll also add in all of their local regional commentary tracks during the matches. These broadcasters also have direct access to all of the footage that was shot within these multiple feeds, meaning that they can use this in their own studio match analysis at halftime and also after each game. And I can't wait for them to analyze Hungary's incredible win at this year's World Cup final match. Hungary didn't get in the World Cup this year. Oh, well, forget about Hungary then. I'm all about reconnecting with my Italian roots. Forza Italia. Aren't in the World Cup this year either. Hit the subscribe <laughs> button over here if you want to cheer me up a bit, I guess. And if you want to know how Apple filmed their incredible keynote events, you can check out this other video over here. And if I did say something inaccurate in this video, please let me know in the comments below. It was pretty tricky to research all of the technical info about the production of this year's World Cup, but I did my best to find the most reliable and accurate sources for you. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.